So welcome everybody. Um, tonight we're going to be doing um, uh, a talk about house plans, a little more homeowner oriented. Normally the Zoom meetings I do are a bit more commercial oriented for commercial growers. Um, just to let you know too, this is being recorded tonight uh, so that we can put it back out there. Um, well, not this whole first chit chat part, but from the potential. <laughs> From the professional start, um, and uh, it will be available online. So just be aware you're being recorded. If you ask questions or anything, uh, that it will be out there. So tonight, um, Michelle is with me. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Suzanne Wainwright Evans. I actually own an insect consulting business called Bug Lady Consulting, which I've now had 20 years. And in normal times, I travel around and help commercial growers solve insect problems, and I focus on biological control. Um, I did grow up in Florida, and I went to the University of Florida. So uh, my background is pretty strong in tropical foliage, um, and I still work in Florida in normal times um, with the commercial growers solving pest issues um, in tropical foliage because they they are a bit different than dealing with some of the other crops. Michelle, uh, who is with us from her house of over 300 house plants, um, go. Uh, she, well, I'm not sure. Am I talking about your day job? No. Okay. <laughs> She, I, I would call her Instagram <laughs> plant <is> famous. <laughs> well, I just say she, she has commercial experience as a plant propagator, IPM manager. She is, she, she's a plant nerd. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she has a very beautiful Instagram call, account called She Wears the Plants. It's, it's total plant eye candy porn if you haven't <laughs> seen her website. Um, mm -hmm. But Michelle and I have become really good friends through the years, and uh, we bounce a lot of ideas back and forth. And this kind of came about because of this little munchkin right here. So um, I know some of you have been following me on social media. Um, this is um, M Michael Jordan. My husband named her. Uh, she showed up back at our house about two months ago. We started catching her on our game camera that I keep at the back door. Um, and then on October 27th, we were actually able to catch her and get her down to the vet. And I'm not going to go into all the medical history, um, but she's had a, a pretty bad time of it. And at this point, um, she has had surgery. She's on several different medications right now, but um, it seems like she does have some permanent neurological damage where she's uh, sometimes struggles to walk and she's got what we call derpy back legs that they just kind of, you know, give out a little bit and she sways when she walks and her tongue just always hangs out and she tends to drool a bit. So there's a neurological problem. And if you can see the x-ray up in the middle, initially um, the vets thought she had been shot. Um, and that's, uh, several vets looked at the x-ray and that was the general conclusion. But actually when my vet got in there, there was a problem from when she was spayed. And that's actually a calcium deposit on her uterus up there, which I, I just can't imagine how that felt. But we got that out um, and uh, she's, she's been having some infection issues. Not, we don't think it's from the surgery. It's really hard to tell. But anyhow, um, in normal times, I wouldn't be asking for community assistance, but it's, you know, been a tough year for a lot of people, and I've pretty much been out of work this year, and um, if you want to put a little tip in the tip jar tonight uh, to help pay for uh, her medical expenses, I'd appreciate it. Do not feel obligated. This is, you know, not a begathon. Um, but if you want to help, um, I'm going to take her back tomorrow. Um, she's actually getting her stitches from her surgery out tomorrow in another checkup. Um, if she, now she's oversleeping by the door, but we'll get her to make an appearance a little bit later. So, but she's a super sweeter. Obviously she was somebody's cat at some point. She knows the sound of a cat food can. She calls, she comes when you call her um, and she just loves to cuddle. She's such a sweet cat, but I, she's probably going to be a special needs cat uh, for the rest of her time with me. So that said, I'm going to let Michelle uh, take control here because I'm going to let her um, start off let me do this. Uh, uh, make host. I'm going to let Michelle take over. I'm going to let her start with the potting soil stuff tonight uh, for her trials. Okay. Let me see. 
Hold on. All right. Can everybody see that? Can you see it? Okay. All right. <laughs> You're all silent now. So I was kind of talking to myself there for a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about potting mixes. Um, again, like Suzanne said, this is really focused on houseplants. Um, as you can see here in the background, I have quite a few of them. And I have found over the years that the potting mix that I use for houseplants, not all are created equal. Um, and it's really important to get it right. So, there we go. Okay, so this is what I mean. Uh, on the left, I had an alocasia cupria, I still have it, but you can see there's something missing in the left side photo, and that's the roots. Uh, this plant was a very expensive plant, and for a while she was doing well, um, but then she started to kind of like decline a little bit. And sure enough, when I popped her out of her pot that I had her growing in, I noticed there were no roots. So I had to reroot her in sphagnum moss. But then the next time I potted her up, I decided to switch up my media mix and use kind of my chunky aeroid mix, which I'll go over later. And since then, she's actually sprouted off three babies um, and about four to five new leaves, which is crazy um, versus when she was on death's doorstep. So potting mixes are really, really important. Um, and it doesn't really have to be expensive. This will go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so a lot of people think that like potting mixes are complicated and that they're expensive, but they're really not. They're not complicated. I pretty much use four mixes and that's all I use for all of my plants. And they're also really easy to find all of the supplies that you need for the potting mixes. Here I've kind of pictured some of my go-to brands, which most of these I find at Home Depot. I think maybe the orchid comes from Lowe's, but these are all super available in your Lowe's, Home Depot. They're very affordable. Um, and you know, you can just go out and get them whenever you need them, which I often do because I, for some reason, never have the one part that I need. So it doesn't have to be expensive. It's very readily available. And between the four mixes that I'm gonna kind of review today, that should pretty much cover all of your plants. Okay, so the first mix is cacti, and we know cacti like to stay dry. So what I do for my cacti is I include perlite and sand. Both of these are really good um, for draining the plants. Um, I will mix in just some of that Nature's Care potting mix that I had photoed, I had pictured up above. And Typically speaking, I put these in a terracotta pot, but it's totally up to you. Uh, the reason I use terracotta is because they like to dry out and terracotta does a really good job of that. So it's kind of eyeballing. I never really measure out my soil mixes. I kind of just take like fistfuls and I say like, okay, one part sand, like one part perlite, etc. So it does, it's not an exact science. Um, but just try when you're potting up cacti, I would recommend adding at least perlite and if you can to add sand. Okay, complete opposite of cacti are calatheas. I'm what you would call a dry grower. I really like to dry down my plants in between waterings and calatheas have always been a struggle for me because they hate being dry, even a little bit dry and they get like just upset. So the best mix I found for calathe calatheas are just worm castings and the potting mix. Um, you'll see, I'm gonna start talking about worm castings. They're in pretty much every single potting mix going forward. I really like adding these because it, <laughs> it feels really good. Um, it's basically just worm poo, um, but if you've ever stuck your hand in a thing of worm castings, it feels really rich and it feels really good. And I've added them to all of my mixes and I see that my plants do much better for it. Um, I like to think that they're getting a lot of nutrients from this. Maybe Carrie Peters later can talk about this if she knows about worm castings. But for me, I like adding it. It's a safe component to add. It's not gonna burn your plants. Um, it's natural. And like I said, it just feels good. Uh, so this is just it for Calatheas. Sometimes I'll add perlite, sometimes I won't but I always use a plastic pot for my calatheas because it really holds that moisture a lot more and they don't like to dry down. I have a calathea orbifolia, which I thought was fine because the soil looked fine, 
but I guess it had dried down slightly and all the new leaves coming in are like burned. Um, so I watered her, kept her wet, kept her a lot more wet than I thought was reasonable. And now all of her new growth coming out is fine. It's a little scary because sometimes I think I'm going to rot these plants, but they really enjoy it. So just, I would just go with this mix for Calatheas. Okay. This is the complicated one, but it's not really complicated, complicated. Um, so this is my, my fancy mix. Uh, I use this for all of my expensive exotic plants, so to say. This has pretty much like everything you can imagine under the sun in this mix. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, I've photoed my, or I've pictured my Anthurium moracanium. And this is probably one of the more expensive plants I have, and I made sure I used this mix for it. In the beginning, that Alocasia cupria that was suffering, I ended up putting it in this mix, and it did a really good job in this mix. So with the tropical aeroids and the exotic like philodendrons and things like that, it's really important to provide a chunky, well-draining substrate. Um, and all of these components in here add that. So both the perlite and the pumice, I call it pumice um, just because it's really just the large grade perlite. They're the same thing. I just, I just like to add in the larger grade perlite as well. Both of those are strictly just for creating pore space and aeration in the pot. Um, but I also add in Lika because Lika does a great job in moving moisture up through the plant or up through the, the media. So that, you know, instead of just having these pore spaces, which may be drier, the Lika will actually do a really good job in making sure that the moisture stays pretty consistent between the pot, between the bottom and the top. What is Lika? Um, I also add in Lika. What is it? It's the clay pebbles. Oh, thank you. Sorry, never heard of pebbles. I've just always known it as, you know, clay pebbles. Okay, thank you. May, I mean, I call it Lika. Well, Some people call it Lekka. I don't uh. Well, you're fancy, so. <laughs> this is the fancy mix. Yeah. Um, so I add in the Lika. It does a really good job of moving and uh, moving water basically, and keeping that whole thing wet. I also add in bark to this mix, um, again, just for that chunky substrate addition. I also like adding bark because it is slightly acidic, and a lot of these plants, especially like the tropicals, most of them are in, in their natural environments in acidic soil. Um, and so that's why I kind of like adding the bark in there as well. Uh, and then again, I add in worm castings and just the basic, um, the nature's care potting mix. And when you're mixing this up, it's going to be a little concerning because you may think like, oh, I've overdone it on the, the perlite and the ad additives and I don't have enough like soil in there. But if you can see like that pot right there with the soil mixed up or the media mixed up, it ends up being just fine. I know it doesn't seem like there's enough soil in there, but there is. Um, and with this one regarding pots, it's really like user's choice with this. If you like to water your plant a lot, maybe a terracotta would be better for you. If you are like me and like to dry down your plants, perhaps plastic is the way to go. Um, I will say that I've started growing these in the grow bags. And I think that the grow bags are like the perfect marriage between like the dry down terracotta and the stay wet plastic. They do a fantastic job of keeping that moisture there, but not like stagnant there because they still do have some air exchange because this is basically a fabric. So I would have recommend starting with a grow bag, but if you want to do terracotta or plastic, it's totally up to you. But I found that grow bags for the fancy plants, as Suzanne calls them, are probably the weapon of choice for this. I did not add in charcoal. And there's been a lot of people who add in charcoal to their media mixes and their potting mixes. I have strongly mixed feelings about it. I haven't tried it yet, but to me, charcoal is alkaline. It'll, it's got a high pH. Um, and so my concern is that it'll raise the pH of the soil a little bit, which I don't want for my plants because I want to keep that pH a little bit lower so that the nutrients are available. So I'm always really concerned about adding charcoal and throwing off the pH a little bit. Also, I've done some reading and people will say that charcoal holds and like absorbs nutrients and then puts them back out. I don't want anything in my potting mix that's going to like take nutrients away from my plant. So 
I have mixed feelings about charcoal. I haven't tried it yet. If you guys have tried it, please let me know. Um, I would be really curious to see what your experience is with that. But it's just something to keep, keep in mind. I personally wouldn't recommend it only because I haven't done it. And I just think it's too alkaline. But some people make it work and it works really well for them. My last mix is just the general houseplant mix. This one's really easy. I basically just add in perlite and worm castings. This is really good for your peperomias, um, your paleas, things like that. Just your general basic house plants. Again, terracotta, plastic. It's really up to you. If you water a lot, terracotta. If you don't water a lot, plastic, maybe. Okay, so here's a recap of the four mixes. Like I said, these are pretty much the only mixes I use for all of my house plants, and they've done really well in all of these mixes. Um, general house plan, again, I would use like Peperomia. I would put Monstera Deliciosa, Adansonii, things like that in this mix just because they're pretty durable plants. I like to save my chunky aeroid mix for the expensive plants because this in, as a whole is a lot more components and it couldn't be a little bit pricier just because the the amount of the components you're pouring into this. So I like to save that one for like the, the fancy plants and the special plants. Monstera Deliciosa, it's fine in the general house plant mix. Um, cacti mix, I don't only do cacti, but I'll put succulents, ZZ plants. I've also started growing, growing string of hearts in this. It works really well. Calatheas, again, just calatheas. Stromanthes, spathophyllum, like peace lilies, things like that. And ferns, because if you've ever dried down a fern, you know. And then aeroids, aeroids again, just the jewel alocasias, anthuriums, your exotic philodendrons, no need to put everything in this mix. It is a little complicated. Save it for your special babies is what I would recommend. And I couldn't, I couldn't do just potting mixes without shouting out to propagation <laughs> mixes. So keep in mind, I know a lot of, a lot of people on this call are growers in like commercial growing, um, but this is really for like the houseplant enthusiast who doesn't have like um, the like fog or a mist system, things like that. So we all grow, we've all tried the whole water thing. Um, water is probably the easiest way to propagate a plant. Um, it's the perfect start for beginners. If you know, you're a little nervous to propagate a plant, you don't know how to get roots out, just honestly, just stick it in water. Nine times out of 10, it'll pop out roots. Um, the only thing I would say about water, um, one of the big disadvantages of this is that the roots that develop in water are not the same as roots that would develop in soil or moss um, because water is, in this case, in most cases for houseplant, you know, enthusiasts, we, when we grow in water, it's stagnant. We're not introducing oxygen or air bubbles or things like that. And so these roots grow in an anoxic environment and they're pretty thick and gnarly. And then what happens is when you put them into soil, they go into shock because all of a sudden it's like all this air and it's drier and they don't know what to do. So water is great, but if you're gonna do water, when you plant it into soil, just make sure you keep it wet for a while because otherwise your plant's gonna go into shock. And ironically enough, the things I found that root best in water are the things that hate water as a plant, um, like succulents. Um, I've also grown string of hearts in water, not, not like my favorite, but I've grown ZZs in water. And here, the Sansevieria, Sansevierias don't like a lot of water, but they root so well in water, it's, it's crazy. Okay, my favorite, my favorite method for propagating is soil because it's so easy. If I could propagate something in soil, I will because I don't have to worry about transplant shock or anything like that. I just stick it in the soil, root it, we're good to go. Um, here is a peperomia I'm rooting in some soil. You just cut the leaves, stick them in soil, and they'll sprout out babies. Um, again, a lot of things do root in soil, um, but the tricky part is the moisture management if you're rooting in soil. Um, so if I root uh, begonia maculata in soil, I'll make sure it's wet. But if I root a string of hearts in soil, I'll dry it down. I'll bring it to like a high level of moisture, level five, like super wet, and then I'll dry it down like bone dry. So it really depends on the plant you're growing in soil. But from what I've seen, 
most all plants you can root directly in soil, but you just have to be really cognizant of your moisture. This is for my fancy plants. Um, moss is uh, one that I've kind of grown into a lot, pun intended. Um, I, when I grow in moss, when I root in moss, a lot of people will just root in like a plastic or a glass container and they'll just put moss in there. What I found is that, you know, when you do that, you're really risking root rot because if you water too much and there's no air, it's gonna, it's gonna root, but then it'll rot because it'll stay wet. So when I root in moss, I like to use neti cups, um, which I'm sure, I think there's a lot of like hydroponic growers on this call. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know what a neti cup is, it's just a lot of times it's, um, it's a cup that they, it's a plant, it's like a, it's a pot that they use in hydroponics when you grow an NFT. Um, and it just has like holes inside of it here to basically it allows water through the whole thing. But for my purposes, it helps me dry down the plants. So I'll keep my moss really wet and I don't have to worry because it'll never rot because it dries out with the holes in the bottom. Um, so neti cups and moss are a really big no brainer. Um, just make sure when you're starting it, you keep it wet. Uh, and then when you start to see roots peak at the bottom, then you can start cycling it through wet and dry cycles. Again, this is what I use for my fancy plants, um, my anthuriums, my jewel alocasias, exotic philodendrons, et cetera, et cetera. Lika, or clay balls. Um, I, I used to use this a lot to propagate plants, but I've since moved on to other methods that I prefer. Um, Lika, you can propagate plants in Lika, um, it's just not as much moisture as you would uh, propagating them in moss uh, because these clay balls, they do a great job moving, um, keeping that water in that whole area, but it is a little bit drier. Um, so a lot of the times I'll pretty much just exclusively root aglaonemas in Lika. I don't know why, I've just found that they root much better in this method. Uh, now when you root in Lika, the whole point is to have that capillary action with clay balls. You don't want to submerge the clay balls in water um, completely because then you're basically water propagating. Um, so what I normally do is I'll just fill up a pot with Lika, put the plant in there, and then I'll fill up the water to about the second tier of holes in that neti pot. Um, and once a week, I may, maybe less, because I forget a lot, um, but I'll run it under the sink just to kind of re-wet anything that may have dried out um, and change the water. Um, and this works really well. And the roots that form in Lika are really healthy roots. Um, but again, I found that Lika is, it's a little, just a little bit slower than the other rooting methods, but it is my favorite for aglaonemas. So the last propagation thing or media, I have really, really strongly mixed feelings about this. Um, I've seen on social media, a lot of people have started rooting in perlite. Um, I tried it. I tried it a couple of times. And every time I tried it, my plant went through this like huge dramatic stress event where it pretty much dropped all of its leaves. And I have no idea why it was so stressed out, but putting it in a perlite just always resulted in like significant leaf drop. Now, eventually it would root, um, but again, the roots that formed were kind of very similar to like the water roots, uh, and I don't really like those as much. This would be a great method to root plants because unlike moss, where if you root in moss, you have to pick off all the moss, this you can just kind of shake it out and, you know, plant it. And I, I do know that growing in perlite um, and, you know, vermiculite mix works really well. My dad grows his tomatoes um, in beto buckets made with perlite and vermiculite, and you can absolutely grow plants in this. But as for rooting plants in this, I'm still not really sold just because of that whole stress event thing that happens when you first start them in this mix. Um, I know some people can do it successfully. I just, I haven't really had a great experience with this one yet, but it would be great to just be able to take the plant out, you know, shake it off and plant it would be great. Um, it's worth trying if you're really curious. I don't really have a whole lot else to say about that though.
Okay, um, <laughs> that's all I have for uh, potting mixes. Um, so go out and grab yourself a big old bag of perlite. I was able to find one that was like human sized bag of perlite. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, but I am going to now give Suzanne permission, um, because she is the woman who knows about bugs. By the way, I got to say, I was a huge fan. I, I still am a huge fan of Suzanne. And before I even started in IPM, I like fangirled over Suzanne so hard. And one time I posted on Instagram a post about mealybugs and Suzanne commented on my post. She actually like corrected me on my post. Um, but I was like, oh my God, guys, Suzanne commented on my post. And I was so excited. Cause like, I was like fangirling hard. And now I get to work with her, which I'm really excited about. She All still right. corrects me to this day. Well, that's not too embarrassing. <laughs> Suzanne, I'm really struggling here to hold on. So I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What, what bark do you use? Just like pine bark? Um, yeah, I think it's fir bark. Um, is I just basically use like the orchid mix bark. Oh, the, or you Sometimes, showed that. You showed that. I okay. I'm yeah. I'm brain dead. <laughs> Sometimes the orchid mixes will also come with like that chunky pumice in them as well, which is like yes. a two for one. Um, right. So I've used that as well. And I know that they have like trace nutrients for um, like phalaenopsis in there, but I, I've used it. It hasn't really hurt my plants. Okay. Yeah. I, you said that I, you put that up there and I, it just didn't, I, I'm, we own a, we own a garden center. So I was thinking pine bark. I don't know what uh, I was. Thinking. I mean, pine bark works. I just don't see it in the stores. Well, no, I, no, obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get big bags of it, but yes. Okay. Or yeah, but, oh, you. if I can just jump in on that though. If you're using pine bark, Lisa, that that's going to suck away some of your nutrients. The fir bark is a little more like aged, you know what I mean? The pine bark's like right. super green. So just remember that. If you're a lot of those, that. we get like professional mixes, like I'll get like pro mix or something. Cause I mix yeah. soils as well. Like she does. Um, and like, I'll get the great big bags of them and it does have, it says aged bark, but I'm pretty sure it's pine yeah. bark. That yeah. might be, it might, it's probably aged pine bark, but if you ever yeah. get the like, like right. straight up, like shaved up pine tree stuff, be aware. Oh, no, no that would suck be bad. away <laughs> lots of stuff from your okay. root zone, you know? <laughs> right. Here, right. Speaking Thank of you. that, Carrie, I really want to pick your brain about your opinion of charcoal. Um, have you used it? Have you seen it before? What do you oh, think? Yeah. About I mean, we yeah. have lots of people that are using charcoal in a whole bunch of different rooting environments, like growing tons of things. And I mean, in my opinion, like when we're trying to figure out the like nutrient, like the right nutrients, I always think about that because what you said, Michelle, was right. It messes with your pH for sure. And then it really can add a double whammy because you're not sure the particle size. Sometimes it's like really fine charcoal and other times it's like this chunky stuff and the fine stuff really messes with you. So I normally try and steer growers almost growing anything away from it unless they're like, you know, hell bent on using it, you know, but it's supposed to be a great like cation exchange. Like the, right. In theory, it's great. In like actual use, I've seen more problems with pH and that messes with things. Yeah. Thank you. Because I was just going on a gut feeling there. Like I said, I haven't really used it because yeah. I was like, Ugh. but thank you. Nice. So I'm not in terrariums too, but I don't use it in terrariums either. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary. Well, um, Suzanne. Did I make you host? Yes, yes, you did. Okay. All I'm thinking about is, Carrie, I guess we're having a big repotting party at your greenhouse. I know, I was writing that down. I'm like, everything I'm doing is wrong and it's all in terracotta. I, <laughs> well, and I'll bring uh, the perlite to the party because we have like six bags, the size of what she yeah. had up in the top of our barn. And I'll bring I'll bring that That's down. Awesome. Yeah, we Who need has? Who has several human-sized bags of perlite laying around? I'm like, <laughs> Lisa, too. <laughs> I have two. 
Uh, it yeah. was back when uh, William was building what I call our slatio, which is our big slate patio. He made all the side bricks and you put it in the cement. And ah. there was a little over calculation on how much we needed. <gasps> Five human sized bags worth. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> We're good on that. So, um, well, I'll go on and talk about some of the pest stuff and then we'll circle back around um, because I think actually, you know, a bunch of us could probably talk forever about all kinds of stuff. But uh, I have to get my work done first before we can uh, chat about all the different stuff. So, okay, there's my screen share. Is it up now? Yep. Oh, okay. I'm going to meet you, Seth, now. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk um, about pest management designed more for house plants. Uh, again, my background in my everyday life is working with commercial growers. Um, this is uh, one of my customers down in Florida that I've worked with for a long time. Where and this is where a lot of your house plants come from, um, especially uh, Florida and then the California market. And then some of the stuff comes offshore. Um, dealing um, with pests. And a commercial growing environment is different than a homeowner environment um, because you guys don't have access to a lot of the different things we do. But I'm going to try to give you some, some tips on things that uh, can help you manage those issues. So first and foremost, and this is actually true for commercial facilities, when plants come in, inspect them. I know we're all guilty of this. I, I could beat myself blue years ago. I bought this beautiful African violet at the Philadelphia Flower Show. And I just brought it home, put it in the windowsill with everything else. About two months later, everything had mealybug. Um, and I mean, that, that's what happens. Um, so when you do get new plants, you want to check them. And you want to check them, you know, the roots, the stems, the growing tips, the leaves. And when I say shake plants out, you know, if you just take the foliage and bang it over a sheet of paper, if there's mites in the plant, they'll fall out. So um, it's important to do that because... You know, I work with commercial growers. They want to sell you clean plants, but the reality is there's no such thing as a 100% insect-free plant. Um, they're doing their best, and even stuff when it gets to garden centers can pick up bugs. Um, so just do your due diligence and check them out. I recommend if you're into plants, always have a 10 to 20x hand lens. Um, so you can look and just check the undersides of leaves just to see anything. And you can see most of the key pests uh, with a 10x hand lens. But, you know, having a quarantine area, like maybe have one of the rooms in your house where if you bring new plants in, that's where they can go to live. Um, my house, probably, and I know Michelle's too, we have plants in every single room of our house. So, um, in fact, my house plant collection has gone so big. <laughs> I went down to Carrie's last weekend and she, cause she has a greenhouse. So she's taking care of all my, my larger children for me this winter, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so just check them and quarantine them if you can. I know it's not always possible, but if you can, that's great. So if you do have a problem, um, sometimes one of the easiest things to do is, you know, remove the problem leaf on the plant, or sometimes, you know, you just have to remove the whole plant. Sometimes you can wash plants off and then, for treatment, there are biocontrol options and then there are pesticide treatments. Uh, homeowners doing biological control is not very economical at this point. I'll talk about a few things um, because for some avid home hobbyists, it may be an option, but if it's just one or two house plants, usually it's not very economical uh, for people to do. So now we're gonna go through, and this is not all the pests you can get on house plants, but these are the more common ones. Fungus gnats is one that is probably one of the most common houseplant issues. Um, we see this often when, um, I, I'm sorry, but Michael is about, to, oh, she was almost going to jump in my lap. She almost did it. This is big step, you know, with the new cat. It's okay. Good girl. Sorry, very unprofessional, but you know. I'm not always professional all the time, but um, fungus gnats. Where I start getting a lot of people asking about this is usually when this time of the year when they brought their house plants in from being outside and they bring them in and then all of a sudden they start getting all these little buzzy things on the soil surface and they can be kind of a nuisance to see and you don't want little things buzzing around your house. Um, this is uh, something we deal with quite a bit in uh, commercial facilities also. Um, 
they're not going to hurt you. Are they going to kill your house plant? Not necessarily, but they, the larva does feed on the roots. And while they're down there doing that, um, they, they can spread plant pathogens and the numbers can grow and grow and grow if you don't get them under control. Um, again, they could be quite prolific. This is what the larva looks like on the left. They're kind of a, a, a clearish worm, but they have a, a dark head capsule on, which you can see um, on the, the front end up there. And they kind of slide through the soil. Um, the best infestation I was ever able to give myself, which I was pretty excited, is I bought an amaryllis bulb that came with a bag of peat. I stuck it in there, watered it. About three weeks later, if you pulled the bulbs out, it was just like a maggot party. I was super excited because I'm always looking for this stuff to photograph, but I was like, oh my gosh, if this was a homeowner, not going to be really happy with it. Because we do know fungus gnat eggs come in bagged potting media. It's just part of life, we know that. And that's why most commercial growing facilities immediately treat for fungus gnats um, as they do preventative treatments uh, so that they don't have them. Now, there are some control options for you. Now, sticky cards are not necessarily a control option, but they can definitely help. Um, you can order them through Amazon and they just are the size of an index card and they're bright yellow and fungus gnats love this color yellow and you can stand them right next to the soil and as soon as they emerge out of the soil the adults they'll stick and so it's a good way to catch a bunch of them and on a homeowner level you can do a lot of mass trapping and get a lot of them removed now other options um there is a bacterium uh, because called bacillus thuringiensis and the actual strain is israeliensis um, it's actually available to homeowners um, and the main way I'm seeing homeowners use it now is through a product called Mosquito Bits. They have added now a houseplant treatment for the Mosquito Bits. Usually people use these to treat water um, and it kills uh, mosquito larva, but that same bacteria will also kill fungus gnats. So you can get the mosquito bits and trop dress plants, or you can mix them with water and drench. When the larva ingest it, it will kill them. There is a little bit of a problem sometimes um, with this product because it's been so overused that there can be resistance, um, but still for homeowners is a good chance it will still work for you and that's a very economical way another way to manage them is beneficial nematodes um, these are becoming more and more popular um, uh, because one homeowners do have access to more of them and i'm going to go into a, a bit more information about using them but basically it's a microscopic worm that you put in the soil and it will feed on soil pests um, almost all my commercial growing facilities use them these days to manage things like fungus gnats and western flower thrips and things like that. You can get predatory mites and um, these predatory beetles called telosia, which are a road beetle. But again, for the homeowner, they're just not really that economical because by the time you buy them and pay the overnight shipping of like $40 or $50, and you're going to get a a product that's designed to treat, you know, thousands of square feet. And so it's gonna to be too much. So really for homeowners, either doing um, the mosquito bits, I think is a good option or the nematodes. Another option is to try to dry your house plants down more because if you get them pretty dry, the fungus gnats often will go away on their own. But if you re-wet it too much and their eggs again, boop, they're gonna be back. Um, so, uh, you know, the, those are a couple options there. But again, I think nematodes are one that, um, again, are being used a lot more. You can see these nematodes right here. Uh, these are just right out of a package under a microscope. Again, these are completely safe for humans and pets. I know people are using them now uh, to treat for like fleas in their yard. Um, I can't get out of this for some reason. Oh, there we go. Um, did you guys see that? Did that run okay? Yeah, those uh, they're using them for flea control in your yard um, and other other uh, pests because beneficial nematodes could do a lot of good things. Um, now for homeowners, there's actually a company uh, called Sierra Biological in New York who is making a package size for homeowners. So if you bring all your plants in, you can get this little sponge here, wring it out in a watering can, and you can go around and water all your house plants. And then that will protect you for, uh, from having fungus gnat issues. Um, I, I, I'm really excited to be able to have 
have home, have homeowners have access to uh, this size of packaging because in the past the packaging has been so large to design more for commercial growers and it was too much product for a homeowner to use but i think this is a perfect way uh, for homeowners to be able to use them and again absolutely safe for people and safe with pets um, once you start reading about beneficial nematodes you'll see there are a couple different species on the market um, and again they're using them for flea control and turf um, cut worms army worms and some other garden pests uh, there's been some research looking at them too uh, for helping with flea beetle management for flea beetles when the larva is in the the soil. So mealybugs are probably, I don't know, do I, do I dare I say the most hated houseplant pest? Michelle says yes. Um, what's been happening is um, the commercial horticultural industry um, has been losing, has, let me say, because of social pressures have reduced their arsenal of pesticides they've been able to use to manage this pest. So a lot of the greenhouses I work with now don't use a group of pesticides called the Neonex because they're concerned about pollinator issues. Well, guess how we manage a lot of different mealybug issues. And now that my growers don't have that chemistry to use, we are seeing more and more mealybugs out there and they are becoming more of an issue. Um, here you can see a mealybug there. Mealybugs are actually a type of soft scale, so it is considered a scale insect. They do produce honeydew and they can produce large amounts of it. What happens is their mouth is like a straw, they stick it in the plant, and they're basically drinking plant sap and they're trying to get protein, but they have they end up taking up so much sugar they can't digest it all, so they end up squirting it out the back. There's several insects that do this, um, including white flies and aphids, but that honeydew can give you that really stickiness on your plant and on the interior scape or indoors it can coat windowsills it can make floors sticky um, it can be a mess ants can then start come to come and will feed on the honeydew and eventually outside often we see it turn into getting sooty mold growing on it the baby mealybugs are super tiny um, and they're these tiny yellow pinheads. That's how they're so easy to miss. You can see a plant, you don't see the big white fuzzballs, but those tiny little pinhead crawlers on there and you bring it in, boop, that's how you end up with them. As they mature, they do get this white fluffy wax on them that kind of protects them. Um, it's not true of every single mealybug species, but a lot of them do have this. And what's interesting and a lot of people don't realize is generally everything you're seeing are females. Um, the males are completely different. And I've actually had people think they have fungus gnat issues, but they weren't fungus gnats. They were actually male scales flying around. So you do have to, um, you know, check to see is it male scales, which generally on a homeowner level, if you had that many male scales, you got big issues. Generally, that's something we'll see on an interior scape that has, you know, 20 foot palm trees and very large plantings. Um, so why are they hard to control? So they feed on all different parts of the plants and they like to get wedged into parts of plants, which can be hard to get contact with. They can sit on an actual side of like your flower pot. You know, you may wash your plant off, but if there's a mealybug crawler sitting on the edge of the pot, they can sit there a while and then move back onto the plant. Um, they can actually, uh, you know, hang out on wood. They can hang out on fabric. It's amazing um, how long they can survive. There was actually some studies done looking at how long mealybugs can lift off a host. And it's surprisingly longer than you would think. Some of them, I think, were like two weeks. They could just sit there without a, a plant. Because we see this again in like, you know, uh, hotel lobbies. You have bad mealybugs. They take all the plants out and bring new plants in. And they were sitting and they're waiting on the walls and on the chairs and then they just move right back in. Um, but again, these crawlers, and you can see on the foot on the left how tiny they are hiding on the plant in there. This is a male scale, male mealybug sitting on a female mealybug there. You can see how different they look. Oh boy, I think Michelle and Chelsea get the most excited face awards for that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, um, they're beautiful and they actually have these little, uh, on top of their head sometimes, they almost look like they have little red jewels on their head. They're really quite pretty, but that's why you don't see them that often. The males come out, they mate, and that's it, they're done. Um, and what you're seeing often is the females with their egg sacs on the plant, the ovisacs. 
Um, some mealybug species are more complicated than others. Solenopsis is a real pain in the backside because when you get, again, wedged in the leaves in there, really the only way you're going to be able to manage this is through a systemic pesticide. And again, we've lost the use of these systemics in a lot of the growing facilities. Um, Again, th these are decisions made at a corporate level. It's not necessarily, there have been regulatory changes where the law says you can't use them. But again, it's from societal pressure to reduce the use of these pesticides. But, you know, in certain situations, uh, especially when you're dealing with tropical foliage that's maybe in your house um, or may not even be a pollinator plant, you know, I still, I think it's safe to use some of these systemic pesticides um, because you, the pollinators aren't going to have contact with the plants. Because even if you wanted to come in and wipe this clean, you can't get them all because they're wedged down there in between the leaves on that. Now, again, as far as control goes, um, I think horticultural oil goes a long way. Um, I, and on my end, I have my end tip slides, have a good horticultural oil product available if you have houseplants. Um, it's good for a lot of the key pests on houseplants. Also works really nice as a, as a leaf shine. So your plants look really pretty. Um, insecticidal soaps can work well on mealybugs as long as you get contact. Imidacloprid is a neonic and it's a bad word for a lot of people. Um, but again, in certain situations, there can be certain applications for it where it's something you can water into the plant, the plant can take it up and it can kill a lot of these piercing sucking insect pests that we deal with on house plants. My word of warning though, is that if it's a plant that is very prone to spider mites, I wouldn't recommend it because we do know that spider mites that feed on plants treated with metacloprid live longer and have more babies. So maybe you get rid of your mealybugs, but you can also now push yourself into a spider mite issue. So be careful with that. And also not all states will allow homeowners uh, have use of this product. Um, there are biocontrol agents, you know, green lacewing is one, um, and there's also the mealybug destroyer, but generally from an economic standpoint, um, it's gonna to be too expensive for homeowners to do. Um, and we have to do constant introduction of these biocontrol agents. Um, sometimes if they're just sitting out on the plant, you know, the Q-tip and a little alcohol, I would never spray a plant with alcohol, but just going through and doing the touch, touch, touch. Um, on a house plant, you could do this. From a commercial growing standpoint, we could never do that because of the labor involved. But sometimes just that mechanical removal with a little, um, Q-tip can go a long way, especially if you can get them before they have their babies. Now, I did want to show you this. So this is a croton because I've worked a lot with crotons through the years. And you can get these lacewing egg cards. And right there are lacewing eggs. And the lacewing eggs will hatch and then they'll climb on the card and up into the plant. Lacewings feed on a lot of different things. Um, are they the go-to control mealybug things? No. But in certain situations, um, this is actually in the lobby of a hotel in Fort Lauderdale, and this is where you go eat your breakfast. And so they can't get in there and really treat the pesticides. So they hang these cards around and they constantly release these eggs. And if they keep the constant lacewing larvae out there feeding, we've been able to get the mealybug numbers down. Not exactly feasible for a homeowner with one or two plants, but if you're a turbo plant nerd and have a lot of plants, this may be an option for you. And you can get them from Green Methods. Green Methods is um, a website uh, that their insectary is actually in California, but Green Methods is the website that you can order beneficials through for homeowners. Um, another thing with mealybugs, please, 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 because I've seen more and more questions about this and a lot of the Facebook house plant, what's wrong with my plant kind of groups, more and more people uh, coming up with root mealybugs. Make sure you pop the pot off your plant and check the roots because you don't want to bring root mealybug in because it's very difficult to manage. Um, 
and you don't want to spread it amongst your house plants. Um, we, we struggle a bit commercially to even control it. So make sure you knock the pots off the plants. And I had somebody tell me, you know, well, you can't go into a store and look at the roots of the plant before you buy it. You test drive a car, why can't you look at the roots? I mean, I would look at the roots um, to make sure, especially on succulents, palms, um, a lot of these tropical plants, you want to check that because it's hard to get rid of and it's hard to also diagnose. Um, a lot of times we find these out in, um, in growing facilities because the plants just aren't greening up and they look nutritionally deficient. And that's kind of an early warning sign. And, you know, they up the fertilizers and the plants just can't take up enough nutrition. Um, and so just check and watch for them and just don't bring them home. And if you did bring them home, I would probably out the door with the plant right away. You, it's, it's, it's very challenging to manage. Scale is another uh, insect, which again, close kissing cousin in a way with mealybugs, because um, mealybugs are a type of scale. But you do have two kinds of scales, armored and soft scale, um, that we regularly see. The soft scale is what produces honeydew, and that's what's going up on the left here. You can see the back end of a female scale, um, and there's this droplet of honeydew uh, on the back. This is that sugar water coming out that we talked about. And these little tiny things here, those are the crawler scales um, that are going to go walk off and um, look for a place to feed. They're very tiny. Again, they're yellowish to orange in colors, but be aware scales overall can come in many color shapes and sizes. Um, the scale down on the left here, this is a female scale and you can see she's starting to push her uh, ovisac out full of eggs. And that means a lot of babies are gonna be coming soon. Same thing with the mealybugs that the adult males um, look like little gnats and can fly around. And they also have these piercing sucking mouth parts. Now here is a soft scale. And I think this was on my bay leaf, I'm trying to remember which plant it was, but it looks in a way harmless enough, but if you flipped it over, you can see all her babies that were under her and what was about to happen. These larger scales are a bit harder to control, but when you have these tiny babies and they're just dispersing, that's the ideal time to hit them with a horticultural oil, even though it can be hard to know when they're emerging. So I always flip scales over when I find them to see what's going on. Because even if you sprayed and you killed this mom, with an oil or a soap that doesn't kill the babies underneath and they're still gonna disperse and you're still gonna have them. So you may need to do repeat applications, but flip some over, see if there's babies under there. And if they are, again, you're, you're gonna probably need to do a couple repeat applications to get them all on there. So as far as products, um, Again, soaps, oils. Now I did add a metacloprid in again, but generally a metacloprid doesn't work that great on the armored scales. It works better on the soft scales and soft scales, the ones that produce that sticky sweet stuff. But generally on house plants, we find more of the soft scales, like the brown soft scale and things like that. Um, and not as many armored scale. Armored scale we tend to find on uh, outside on things like holly. Um, and again, they don't produce that sticky substance. Biocontrol, there's really not a commercial option for you for house plants, but you can go through with a Q-tip and dip and wipe and wipe and dip, but just make sure you get all those little babies um, off of there. So spider mites are another one um, that uh, can be an issue. I see Michelle's face lighting up with spider mites. <laughs> yeah, um, spider mites love tropical foliage. Um, Alocasias, calocasias, deep and bacchias, crotons, cordylines. I mean, that's in Florida, this is where we spend the most time managing um, a tropical foliage is spider mites. And that's why so many of the commercial growers do use biocontrol agents. Um, we're gonna talk tonight a little bit more about two-spotted spider mite, because this is probably the more common one that um, is seen. Now, these are not insects. These are mites. So as an adult, they have eight legs where insects as adults have six legs. These guys feed differently. Instead of going in and feeding on the plant sap, they actually feed on plant cells. And this is why those systemic pesticides don't work very well. You don't see you know, products you can dump on the soil that will kill mites up on the plant. You really have to have better contact with these uh, to kill them. 
I say they're pretty much everywhere because the two spot spider mite is so cosmopolitan. It's in most greenhouses I go to, it's in interior scapes, it's in garden centers, it's in the landscape, they ride on the wind, they're just everywhere. So they're pretty easy to get. One of the really interesting things about them too is the females don't have to mate to have babies. So if you just bring in one female spider mite, you can end up, and this picture down here, that was actually a, a mini rose that was indoors. And obviously the mite population had just completely gotten out of control on that. And when they get really high numbers, you know, they have their whole webbing highway and they cluster up at the tops. I know a lot of people think it's gross. I think it's super cool. I try to get plants to do this and I, I struggle with it um, because spider mites really like it um, hot and dry and my house is just cold. <laughs> so I can't get my numbers quite up there. So as far as control, as far as sprays go for a homeowner, um, horticultural oils, oils work so well and just not any oil. Uh, for the homeowner, this Monterey horticultural oil, I am a huge fan of this. Um, this would be the go-to product I would recommend for, again, your, your mealy bugs, your scales. Um, I don't want to say this oil is completely idiot proof. You can burn plants with it, but your chances of burning with it are a lot less than some of the heavier oils. Um, this is approved for use in organic production, so you can feel safe about using it. Um, we use this product in commercial growing facilities and it works extremely well. It will not only control adult spider mites, it will control the immatures and the eggs. Um, if you don't want to get into spraying your plant, you can just wash your plant. And actually I do this at my house. I go take my plants, I put them in my shower and shower and wash them. There's actually some studies uh, looking at spider mites on drip irrigation compared to overhead irrigation and stuff with overhead irrigation have fewer spider mite issues. Uh, that washing action and getting uh, the humidity up on the plant actually can reduce this pest. So sometimes just giving them a good wash. But again, this Monterey horticultural oil, um, and they do make a smaller bottle of it, um, and you can get it up to in a 55 gallon drum if you want. But I think it's an excellent, excellent product for many of the key pests. And again, it'll make your plant look really pretty. I will tell you, if you're gonna spray a plant, don't spray it in your windowsill. You gotta take it either to the sink or somewhere you can put it on a tarp because you don't wanna spray oils onto your windows, onto your windowsills, onto your floors and carpets. So be aware of that. So there are biocontrol options, and this is what a lot of commercial growers do. If you are an avid, avid home hobbyist plant collector, this might work for you um, because they are so efficient. But again, the cost is usually the setback because you can get a vial of this first predatory mite, Phytocelius persimilis, that's the one on the left, this bright red predatory mite. It destroys spider mite, but for you get a small bottle, the mites are gonna be about $20, then you're gonna to have to pay overnight shipping. And depending where you are in the country, um, most of these are gonna come, well, if you order through green methods, they're gonna come out of California. So if you're in California, it's not gonna be as bad as if you're on the East Coast to pay the overnight shipping. Um, those are an option, but generally pretty cost prohibitive if you just have one plant and, you know, just uh, spraying your plant down with an oil will probably suffice uh, for what you need to do. So I just wanted to throw this in here. Um, Michelle, do you know what this is? Anybody want to guess what this is? Anybody know? It's an aloe plant. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it kind of, mm, it kind of like looks like weird creepy aphids but i don't know i've never seen this anybody else want to guess on this one it, it took me a while but i i so it's it's not something come but it's it's very interesting because this is the plant responding to a pest issue oh that's cool yeah so this is damage from an area mite the tiny tiny little mites yeah um, you know, kind of a cousin to like a broad mite, broad mite. but this is, a uh, yeah, this is, is, uh, close this, yeah, it's an area fired and it can cause this kind of damage. Um, there's an area fired that also gets on yucca that it makes it look like it has powdery mildew. 
So mites sometimes can be tricky and you know the, the plant response can be very different than what you'd expect from a mite. But if you Google it, this is a, a common problem in aloe production. So again, it took me a little while to when I was at the facility, but I got it. So, um, but it's not something you could just go see with the hand lens, but that's a plant response there to it. So another pest, which isn't super, super common, on house plants, um, in fact, I think I threw this slide in there. You know, there's a lot of very specific ones on tropicals, but they're generally not big house plant pest issues. So I'm going to zip back over here. This one at the top, um, that's damage from thrips on uh, Ficus benjamina, um, which that's why you don't see a lot. One of the reasons you don't see a lot of Ficus grown anymore, Ficus benjamina, is because of the thrips issues. Um, this is a hawthorn on the left, that's thrips issues, and this is a shuffleera, that's thrips damage on it. This down here is due to chili thrips, which is something we are seeing a bit more uh, moving around the country. So thrips damage can be specific to the kind of plant. It can all look very different because what we're used to seeing for thrips damage on ornamental uh, spring color, the streaking of blooms is very different. But when these thrips feed on the ficus, it causes the leaf to taco and the leaf to fold. And the eggs and everything are inside of there. So contact pesticides don't work because you can't get contact with it. So everybody's picking tacos off of the leaves before the plants ship. But if you've got thrips on a leaf that hasn't tacoed yet, the thrips still get to go for the ride up north and then get into places. Um, but the one that's on ficus is specific to ficus and doesn't spread to other plants. So what they actually do is they rasp on the plant cells and it can cause streaking, discoloration, and distortion. So this here, uh, again, is croton. And see how you have this puckering on the side here? That's from a thrips feeding when the new leaves were just being formed. So as the leaf expands, you see the damage. And oftentimes, by the time you see the damage, the thrips is already gone. So it, this is a tough one that like on crotons, we try to be preventative um, about a bit because you've got to catch it and, and manage it before uh, the damage happens because there's no recovering from it on there. Now, as far as control, again, homeowners are very limited, but soaps and oils uh, can do a good job of knocking those adults down on there. There are beneficial uh, insects and mites, but the reality is it's just they're not going to be a good fit for homeowners. Um, you're going to be better off, you know, maybe trying to use some sticky cards to trap some of the adults. I gave it the asterisk because you're not going to get a ton and things like the ficus thrips, which you can see right here um, with its eggs. Um, they're not going to be flying around so much because they're inside of that taco. Um, so realistically, um, spraying with a soap or an oil is probably going to be one of the better options and just constantly doing it to get ahead of the problem or you know get rid of the plant um, but it's good to identify what the plant is and if the thrips on it is host specific or is it considered what we call cosmopolitan species because again the one on ficus stays on ficus but there's another thrips out there called echino thrips um, it, it feeds on lots of different plants. So if you bring it in on one plant, the echinothrips can spread to your other plants. And we do see that one on things like Diefenbachia um, causing damage. So some basic tips, um, you know, check your plants often. Um, I know us that work in the plant industry, we sometimes have blinders about our house plants sometimes because we, you know, we look at plants all day long always have a quarantine area for new stuff coming in just to be sure. I would keep some insecticidal soap or horticultural uh, uh, oil handy. And please notice I'm saying insecticidal soap. I'm not saying Dawn dish detergent. I'm not saying palm olive. I'm not saying Dr. Bronner's. I'm saying insecticidal soap. It's a different carbon chain length than the other um, soaps that are designed for other purposes. Um, and also know when sometimes you just got to toss the plant. That's that's a very hard thing for me um, to do, but sometimes, you know, you just have to do it. Um, don't worry, there's always more plants out there to buy. So what's that face, Michelle? Can we just like, can we just kind of look at this photo on here a little <laughs> bit closer? Cause I feel like the photo needs a little bit of a shout out. 
is this thing is this a it's an aphid right is it's it just, just like aphid. rocketing out babies like yeah. <laughs> Your artist is phenomenal. Mario is the bomb. He, he does great <laughs> things for me. Um, I just tell him what I want, and I'm like, yeah, I want it even shooting babies out, because that's what she does all day long. So This is incredible. Yeah, we need to get that on a t-shirt. Um, we do. Right now, we're doing the hemp russet my t-shirt. Yeah, those are getting close. That's pretty excited about those. I, don't worry, Sam. Santa Claus may be coming your way. So, all right. So, um, so let's open this up for um, questions. Um, there's my contact information if anybody does have any questions at other times, my social media. Um, and then if, you know, again, no obligation from anybody. I don't want anybody ever to feel pressured, but if you wanna, oh, she's sleeping at my feet. The little nugget, um, you know, yes, you, yes, you. Okay, so you are calling her a nugget now. Well, that's your fault because you started, <laughs> you got me calling her a nugget. She's um, a nugget. Yeah. You want, hi, you want to come up? Here, I'm going to see if I can get her to come up and say hi. Then by her. Oh, come here. Oh, oh. Here. Ah, uh, look uh, at the tongue. I know that's oh, so she, cute. And she's purring too. Look, look, Michael. That see? tongue is so cute. You're going to be Zoom famous. <laughs> She's like, eh, just feed me more. Just feed me more. Or she's definitely purring. I can feel her. Aww. Now she's going to sit on my lap. So does anybody have any uh, questions? And again, uh, Dr. K Dr. Carrie Peters is here with us tonight. If you have more nutritional questions, um, <laughs> if anybody has anything they want to ask. I have a question. So tell me your, I just was on a um, Instagram live. I wasn't on it. I was watching it. And some people are just so down on neem oil. Tell me about neem oil. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan. Um, okay. Tell me why. Okay. So I think there's inconsistencies in some of the products. Um, neem oil is not neem oil. Um, also, from a biocontrol standpoint, um, neem oil actually has pretty good repelling qualities. Produced done some great work where, you know, they spray plants and, you know, Japanese beetles for a few days will not feed in them. So there's repelling qualities where that sounds great in theory, but if you're trying to do a biocontrol program and you spray plants and you want to get the bios in there right after you do that knockdown spray with neem, that neem could repel some of your beneficials right off the plant. Um, also, I'm concerned about phytotoxicity. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I mean, for some applications, it'd be fine. But for my growers that are using a lot of biocontrol agents, not not a huge fan. Now we have had some also other issues too with neem, and there's been lots of arguments about this um, because the state of Oregon was testing neem oil and azadiractins, and they found trace pesticides in there. I think durazban, bifenthrin, and there was another one, um, which they're very very small amounts. So it's not like anybody's putting pesticides in there on purpose. I think it may have to do with how the trees are grown and all of that. Yeah. 